We love our cars, but have they taken over our lives? I think it's a way of life that's undermining the way we exist as communities and people. Coming up, does the car drive America? The limits of automania. I want that car. You're out here, nobody the $12,300. I've got 12, two, three, four, 12, four. It's a stick ship, man. <laughs> it's the, to be free, to be, to be yourself, to have your own place on this earth. And a lot of people don't have the money to own their own home, but they certainly can own their own car. From King 5 News, this is a special Compton Report. It's Rag Talk Day. It's Rag Talk Day. It is a harmless affliction, the love of the car. And I confess, I've got it. The need to tinker in the garage or restore an old Mustang or a Studebaker. But for many Americans, automania goes beyond the benign. It has become an obsession or even fanaticism. Today, we explore the frontiers of the automotive and ask why the country that invented the car is now dominated by the car. It's a California car stored wow. 25 years, but out of yellow on the outside and just black and beautiful on the inside. Fuzzy dice to go. In Reno, once a year, they auction off dreams. 12 grand, 12 five, you're out. 12 five, you want it? I got 12 grand, you have to buy them, everybody can find them, but I got 12 five. 12 grand, 12 five. It's a stick ship, man. <laughs> These people are not shopping for transportation, but what are they buying? They are definitely art objects. This, this is nostalgia, this is memories. Mitch Silver, the auctioneer, claims people merge identities with their car. There's a marriage of you with the piece of art. Here, you can get in it, you can drive it, you can take it to the car show, you can take it to the A&W, you can take your family cruising, so it is a little more practical than a lot of art. It's no wonder we fell in love, for the auto promised freedom, and those who piloted the early racers were among our most romantic heroes. The automobile merged completely into our lives. When Americans left the Dust Bowl states in the 20s, it was in a melancholy procession of Fords and Plymouths. And even when the price of gas soared to 29 cents a gallon, we kept driving. And now America, which today has half the world's cars, 200 million of them, is growing ambivalent about the blessings of the auto. For every person who idolizes the horseless carriage, there seem to be two who despise its effects. I'm saying that what used to be a service and something that helped us and gave us freedom of the road has now begun to become the master of our lives. Jane Holtz Kay is a Boston writer who has given up her automobile to mount a one-woman crusade against the car. And that we have to get a handle on it and we have to learn to move in ways that don't require a couple of tons of rolling steel and wheels to get a quart of milk, that there's a better way to live. It's committed a lot of brutal swipes at the landscape in terms of being just plain ugly. Yet the car that has brutalized the landscape has gladdened many souls and has acted as a great equalizer in American society. Larry Amaral bought this 1916 Ford hot rod for his wife. My car over there may be worth $5,000. To me, it's worth a million. I'm up here with a man that's paid $100,000 for his car, and everybody's looking at his car just as well as they're looking at my car. And others revere the car in another way. Millions of them who flock to the dirt tracks at Monroe and OMAC for the sheer thrill of seeing collisions on a track that is shaped like a figure eight. We can't do any of this stuff on the street. If you want to burn some rubber, there's a place to do it. It's a kind of thinly disguised chaos that's probably more like life than film or theater. This drama happens before your eyes Noise, confusion, road rage. 
Feeding your front bumper into somebody's rear bumper just to let them know that you might be just a little bit faster. It's not bad if you're the one that's shooting against somebody else, but when somebody's shooting looking at your door, that's, you know, it all depends upon what the other driver is. Well, that's just it. Everybody's here to watch a wreck. They're not here to watch good, tight racing. They're here to watch the wreck. You can't be mentally normal to do this. What's addictive about it? The danger or the... The thrill. The thrill of having a car coming at you at 60 miles an hour. What if it hits you? It hurts. It's the, to be free, to be, to be yourself, to have your own place on this earth. And a lot of people don't have the money to own their own home, but they certainly can own their own car. I don't know who made the first art car. America's mixed feelings about the car are nowhere more evident than in the so-called art car movement. My approach to the automobile is just to fight it. You know, when I make, when I make a car, I, I redesign it using materials i reach for anything that's next to my hand goes onto the car part of this is people's dislike of their cars isn't it right well in my case i happen to think automobiles are inherently ugly so what i'm doing is beautifying them filmmaker herod blank has documented the art car movement which has followers in dozens of cities and himself built the renowned camera van covered with 1700 cameras some working cheese yeah, there's a form of rebellion that's, that's inherent in a lot of these different uh, art cars. What would a person be doing when they grow grass on a car, for example? Well, that's a form of rebelling, too, because they're, they're taking something that's uh, an object that pollutes, and they're, they're transforming it into something that, that provides oxygen at the same time, and it's an environmental statement. It, there's a whole process that the car goes through from the time it sprouts, and until it dies and, and I kind of adhere to this I have to water it every day and have to care for it and uh, I just developed this real love for it it's like the clothes you wear you know it's it's it's, it's an extension of that it's an extension of yourself it's your alter ego that's why I don't personally understand why so many people adopt the image that's fed them from society from these automakers I don't understand why people adopt that as their own as their own alter ego, their own uh, image. What do you want me to do? You're doing it. I do it because I like it. And I do what I'd like to do and it doesn't matter to me what, what you know, mainstream society thinks. It's more just about you can't be in a crummy mood and drive an art car. You can just be ready to flip somebody off on a freeway and then you notice they're waving at you. And, <laughs> Uh, your character, the way you are, this is part of it. And what you drive helps to define who you are. Stay with us, more coming up on America's obsession with the automobile. Could it be that this is the one invention in this century that's had such an impact and has changed our whole society? Far from the drag strips in the hushed halls of the Harrah's National Auto Museum in Reno, the automobile is given a reverence that you associate with the cathedrals of France. What you will not see here are custom cars or hot rods, although the museum says it may someday acquire some. And the curator of one of the world's premier automotive collections, Jackie Frady, has a melancholy message. There's hardly a car made today that she would put in her museum. I'm afraid that may be the case. I think now there are necessities and they get us where we're going, but the cars that touch our hearts are the ones we collect. But I'm having a hard time identifying what that car is going to be, that 20 years we're going to look back. Where do I need to be 20 years from now and 50 years from now? Riding along in my automobile My baby beside me as the wheel the automobile's truest worshipers gather annually in Reno, Nevada for a celebration of painted iron that is unlike any other. This is Hot August Nights, the four-day gathering of car lovers that is a phenomenon itself. This is the most accessible of car shows. No Duesenbergs or Maseratis required here. Just good old Detroit iron. You restore them and they're like new. Cruising and playing the radio. With no particular place to go. 
Car customizing has been widely honored as high American art. It achieves lofty design and fine craftsmanship, often rivaling the art we put in museums. Cool. Awesome. But unlike the high art of museums and galleries, the car show is open to all. The neighborhood mechanic has become artist, the body shop his studio. And is this sculpture in metal any less monumental than the work of Renaissance masters? Did the oil paintings of the Dutch masters ever achieve surfaces or textures like this? And high auto art often involves sound. Although throaty pipes may offend some, they are musical to the car lover. There's a premium here, not just on workmanship, but on originality and whimsy. Ever see your kids have fun like this at a museum? And a few miles away, there are friendly drags on a shortened course. This is another part of the obsession, the cultivation of speed, the construction of cars of such brutal horsepower that they can't be driven on the street. of these engines can only be appreciated firsthand. They shake every fiber of your body. But the biggest joy of hot August nights is strolling city streets lined with thousands of custom cars when the real camaraderie of the auto cult emerges. That's the sound. This Shelby Mustang enthusiast is candid about how cars stirred the male hormone testosterone. When you turn the engine on and you hear the rumble, it, you know, it doesn't do it for everybody, but you know, uh, for- But you know, it does people, something for you. For, for, for me and for most of the people here. Now, that testosterone part, <laughs> that's, uh, I guess that's about boys and girls, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's right. This couple came from Calistoga, California, just to see the vintage Chevs. I want that car. My dad bought one in 1957. I went there with him to pick it up. It was on the showroom floor, black and white. I've loved it ever since. This is the 11th year for the Amaral and Silva families of Vallejo, California. They brought six cars, a 1916 Ford T-Bucket with a 386, a 1951 Chev sedan, a 50 Chev pickup truck, a 53 GMC Suburban, and the 1946 Ford that was once an Oakland police car. When I was about 18 or so, I had a 32 Ford with a B&M Hydro in it, and I used to race down at Fremont Drag Strip, and I turned 140 in the quarter. And now they tell me I'm 140 years old, and I can't even make a quarter. Like many here, the Amaral's feel ignored by the American media. Mainstream newspapers and television show little interest in these events, even though they involve millions of people nationwide. I get ir irritated that the press doesn't cover it more when it's, it is such a family-oriented event. Hey, they, they really show, they show up at Pebble Beach for the big uh, Absolutely. European car show. Maybe we don't have enough money. <laughs> we don't play golf. <laughs> and there is an internal snobbism at work here between those who work on their own cars and those who don't. There's a class distinction. You have people who buy the classic cars and they have everything done to them by the top-notch people. If you go to actual car shows, like your Roadster shows and everything, they're the ones that win all the prizes, not the people that have put their heart and soul into it and have put you know, but they have done everything themselves. And coming up, the Mustang cult and what it does to people. It's Hudson clock that came out of the 40s. If Automania takes a dozen forms, the purest obsession is that of the collector. Well, I know I've had, you know, I've had customers come in and buy cars from me that just no way they can 
afford them, but they want them. Seattle classic car dealer Jerry Drager deals in nostalgia and admits that it is sometimes excessive. I mean, nobody needs a 56 Nomad. Nobody needs this car. There's no reason for anybody to need but they want it. It's, it's just the way it is. They want the car, and that's it. On Mustang Day at Seattle International Raceway, Randy Dunphy, one of the top local racers, is taking his daughter Becky for a ride in a rare vintage Shelby Mustang. Yes, I'm getting a ride. I've been waiting for this for three years. You prepared to get scared out there? No, I'm excited. I trust my dad. He's a good driver. Perhaps no car in automotive history has inspired a following like the Mustang. We have a 1970 Mustang Mach 1 428 Cobra Jet. Ned Bellinger, with help from Dick Knight, is restoring a rare and hot Mustang to standards that probably exceed those of the factory. We're doing it better than when it came from Ford. We've done the stainless steel valves. These Mustang restorers bristle a little at the suggestion that a 30-year-old V8 is an obsolete technology. Uh, every part in this car is in better shape than anybody driving down the road in their um, nine, five year old car. Every time I went to the beach with Albert, some big muscle guy was always kicking sand in his face. I wonder what ever happened to him. Albert's a Mustanger now. Is there a certain amount of adolescent uh, uh, nostalgia here. I mean, you're going to go out and go to the drive-ins and burn rubber? Or? For me, it is, because uh, when I was young and I couldn't afford this car, I would always wanted something like this, but now that I'm older and I think I can handle it without killing myself, I think it'll be fun. Bellinger has another unrestored Mustang in such perfect condition that it has never lost a competition. He admits that he once stripped and repainted the horn to repair a tiny scratch. Would you concede that it, it's borderline mental illness? <laughs> uh, no. But consider this Mustang with only five miles on it in the last nine years. In 1989 is when I started the restoration. I finished it in 1993. I'm hoping that this car someday will make it into the Mustang Museum. Dick Knight has come close to scoring a perfect 700 points in concourse competition but seems always to get points subtracted when judges find tiny hairline scratches on an original window. This car has been in Mustang Monthly, which is the most widely advertised uh, magazine. It also is in a hardback book that Ned's holding. My gosh, there it is. It, is. it has won seven uh, best of show trophies. Um, and I, I put it up against 1,500 cars. This is probably the largest gathering of Mustangs in one place annually in the world. Mustang fever is not an isolated illness. The August Mustang Show, 1,200 cars this year in Bellevue, is the largest in America. It's an awful lot of fun because I, uh, I drive the car pretty much on a once a week basis and I try to do it when the weather's nice, but once in a while I even take it out in a rainstorm just to see what it's like to drive. I've been married and divorced five times since I've had this car. Ford made more Mustangs than any other model, and a third of a century after their introduction, they have a religious following. Unless I'm mistaken, most churches down around here don't draw 1,200 cars on the weekend. This is a uh, cult, isn't it? Uh, it is. It is. And, <laughs> and you even get preachers that come here. And when we return, I'll have some final thoughts about where the automobile has taken America and what's still down the road. We haven't just embraced the car, we have married it. 12,000 miles per car per year. Eight billion hours a year stuck in traffic, by one estimate. 
83 billion dollars a year spent on roads. It's been a good ride, and I confess I love the old heap of iron that I drive down the road, but a time is coming when we're going to run out of gas. We're going to exhaust the fossil fuels of this planet, and we're going to have to look elsewhere for energy, perhaps something renewable like the sun to power, to fuel our obsession with the automobile. I'm Jim Compton. Thanks for watching The Compton Report. That's a 1968 Shelby uh, GT500KR. This is a, a factory 66 KGT fastback. It's it's a passion. Cars are cool. Cars uh, cars get your blood. Yeah, it's it's my vice. It's something different, something massive. People can't miss this, and it's a fun car to have. You get stopped, and people ask me about it all the time. I enjoy it. Mm -hmm.